In every moment, you choose who you want to be and how you want to live your life. It is your ultimate power and your inescapable responsibility. You are the master of your reality. But it doesn't always feel that way. Too often, we believe our misguided assumptions. We believe our awful fears. We perpetuate our insecurities and vanities. We misperceive our luck and success and value in life. And we fail to listen to each other and to our own hearts. How can we take back control, creating the lives we want uh, with awareness and intention? That's the question we consider in this interview series, Mastering Your Reality. And we consider the question with remarkable people who have a lot to teach us on the subject. Today's guest is one such person. Dan Pink is truly among my favorite authors. The man is a genius. Uh, through careful research, he aggregates all sorts of information from all sorts of different fields, uh, and he comes up with these remarkable insights that can change the way we live. Uh, and, and I love him for it. I love his work. Uh, he's written all sorts of great books, uh, including uh, Drive and To Sell as Human. And today we'll talk a bit about his latest book, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I think it's a pleasure. Glad to be here. Excellent. Um, Dan, tell us, please, to begin... Uh, about your latest book, When? The latest book, When, uh, it's, a, it's a book about the science of timing. And if there's a big idea in it, the big idea is this, that we tend to think that timing is an art. We make our timing decisions, decisions about when to do stuff, generally based on intuition and guesswork. And that's the wrong way to do it, because there is this rich body of science that can give us guidance on all, a whole array of, a whole array of decisions from you know, mundane decisions like when in the day should you exercise to more consequential decisions about managing projects or even the course of your life. So I think that you are giving the collective us way too much credit by saying we do it through intuition. I think a lot of us just do it by default. We don't even necessarily yeah. know. Yeah, that's, that's actually, you know what, that's actually a really good point. I, I think, yeah, I'm with you on that, um, that we do. And I think that's a big problem. Uh, one of the things uh, I, I don't write—I don't write about this in the book—but one of the um, William James, who uh, was a one of the a philosopher, American philosopher, um, one of the basically one of the fathers of psychology before it was really like a true science. Science. He was really more of a philosopher, but he basically helped birth modern psychology. Psychology as we know it. Uh, he has this line, um, I, uh, it, it haunts me, uh, from, from his book on uh, varieties of religious tradition, where he says, most of us go through life, here's the phrase, only half awake, only half awake. And, um, and that has bugged the heck out of me ever since I read that, because it makes me wonder, am I going through life only half awake? But, it's some, but, to, some, to, but to a large extent, you're exactly right, that many of us, myself included, go through life only half awake. And so these decisions that I'm describing as based on intuition and guesswork are not even really decisions. They are just things that we do, as you say, very appropriately by default. Now, I, in all sincerity, absolutely love everything you've written and everything. Hey, thanks. And everyone who's, who's, who's listening to me talk right now should stop and immediately read all of Dan's books. But Or at I, least buy them. I, at least buy That's exactly right. People tell me, oh, I bought your book. I say, great. I don't really care if you read it now. Yeah, Obviously, right. of course I can. Um, Dan, though, this one, if I can sort of continue on this theme for a second, you know, my yeah. whole eyes wide open spiel and vision and philosophy, you know, really is about living, you know, deliberately Absolutely. and with intention. And one of the reasons uh, that I was so intrigued by this book and so excited to you know, have the chance to meet you, I guess, a couple months ago and, and have you on to, to chat is... Um, at sort of underlying the, the very thesis of the book really is that idea. Like let, let's live intentionally and deliberately and let, let's Absolutely. actually give some thought to how we're going to order our time. Absolutely right. I agree with you. Isaac. I think that is the, you know, if there's kind of like a meta takeaway, it's, it is that it really is that it, it is intentionality, and it's very eyes wide open. It's, it is intentionality um, in, in doing things. And so we, we make, so, um, and, and it really runs. It really runs the gamut. It runs things from you know, like when in the day should you do your work, when should we have meetings, to also things like, hey, you know, what should I do at this stage of my life, and how do I really think about time, and is it really true that we should be living in the present, or is there something more 
complex than that in our relationship with time. And it all has to do with deliberateness, intentionality, uh, going through life, you know, fully awake with our eyes wide open. It's almost like uh, another thing I love about about the book that you, you just mentioned. It, it, it's almost like it reminds me of kind of like fractals where, you know, the bigger shape and then it you know, comprises the smaller shape and it reduces all the way down. This point that you make, um, I love that there are insights for like today, when, when to have the meeting, when to do your creative work, when to, yeah. you know, but, but also like over the arc span of your life. Yeah. And that's yeah. just and, a cool thing. Yeah. It's, it, uh, but again, it, it forces us to have a, I'm, again, I mean, it forces us to have a multidimensional view of the world. Right. And, 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 and a lot of times we do have some deliberateness about what we do. Uh, we we have some deliberateness about who we do it with, how we do it. But on the when question, like when we do stuff, there's very, very little, um, there's very, very little deliberateness. And my point is that it matters. I mean, we know in at the unit of a day that uh, if you look at something like the the variance in how people perform on cognitive tasks, we can explain 20% of it based on time of day. I mean, that's a big freaking deal. It's, it's incredible. If you think about it, like, how do we explain the variance and how, like, okay, so we have like, like, like just, you know, imagine a, 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 a chart that plots people from, uh, what, uh, from left to right, you know, and left is, hey, you're not that great. And right is, hey, you're awesome. Um, and we like, we're trying to explain the, the variance, you know, kind of, you know the, the difference between why are some people here and why are some people there, what accounts for that. And when we think about that, you know, on cognitive tasks or at work, you know, we're all kinds of explanations. Hey, some people actually are smarter than others. Sure. Some people are more hardworking than others. Some people are more conscientious than others. Big factor. Some people have more social advantage than others. Like they didn't just get to that spot on the chart, you know, on their own. They were just kind of bored, you know. And and so all these really important factors in performance. And we're saying 20% of it we can explain time of day. Holy smoke. I mean, we can do something about that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's you know I think that's one of the things that I like about about writing this book and, and and talking to people about it. Meetings, important substantive meetings. When should we have? Depends. Uh, here's what we know. Uh, but but that's the question. Most people don't even ask that question because when we schedule meetings, the only criterion we use is availability. We say, hey. Is there a hole in Isaac's schedule? Is there a hole in Dan's schedule? And is conference room 3C open? All right, what we should be thinking about is this. And so let me take three steps back and, and explain this. What we know generally is this, that most of us, about 80% of us, move through the day in this order. A peak early, a trough in the middle of the day, and a recovery later in the day. Okay, peak, trough, recovery. Now, about 20% of us, people who are owls, who have what are called late evening chronotypes, people who typically go to sleep late and, and, and wake up late. And again, that's about 20% of the population. They're more complicated. They go through in the reverse order. Well, sometimes in the reverse order, but the most important thing for them is that they hit their peak much, much later in the day. Now, two more quick words. Well, 20 more quick words. Ah. Um, the peak. The peak is when we're highest in vigilance. All right, Vigilance means we can bat away distractions. So that makes it the best time to do analytic work. The trough is a terrible time for us um, um, the, the that mid that early mid afternoon. Uh, there's all kinds of data on how dangerous it is to be in the hospital then, even how dangerous it is to be on in traffic then. Um, that's when we should be doing our administrative work, which doesn't require major cognitive loads. And then the recovery later in the day, basically around the time that you and I are talking, beginning around the time that you and I are talking now. I think it's a good time to do this kind of interview. Is um, recovery is when our mood is back up. Uh, but we're less vigilant. And so um, that makes it a good time for things that require a little bit more looseness, a little bit more, um, you know, freewheelingness. Um, and, um, and, and, so, and so that's it. So the question, when should we have our meetings, is this. we got to ask, what kind of meeting is this? Is this a meeting where we want people to be locked down and focused? Is it a meeting where we want, are, are we iterating ideas? Are we brainstorming? Uh, is it a meeting that's purely administrative? We're talking about our travel voucher policy. Um, and also, who's going to be at the meeting? And this is important, too. Is it going to be the 80% of us who go peak trough recovery? Or do we have a lot of people on our team who are much more, you know, who are much, uh, much allier? Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so, and that's the question, that's the question to ask. 
And so, uh, and, and what we don't do is we don't ask that. And the thing about meetings is such a good question because there's so many, I, I don't even know the number. I should figure out this number. Well, I gotta write this down to figure out this number. But I mean, how many millions, it's probably, it's gotta be more than millions, hundreds of millions of person hours are spent across America, right, not to mention the rest of the world in meetings. Oh, uh, man. And yet, and yet um, there's zero, you know, again, I'll borrow your phrase. Like we don't go, we don't, we don't schedule the meetings with our eyes wide open. The only, all we do is, you say, you know, hey, is Isaac available now? And is there an empty conference room? And 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 that's the, you know, and that's and that's and that's really, really the that that's really the big mistake. And so what I try to do myself, I don't do a lot of meetings, but I do, you know, uh, um, calls and things like this. Uh, and also, just the rest of my work as a writer. Um, is trying to be much more deliberate in in scheduling when I do when I do certain things. So I'm someone I test as my so called my chronotype. I'm not a, I'm not like a super strong morning person, but I'm morning ish. I'm on the morning side of it. So I should be doing my writing in the morning, all right? That's analytic work. I have to you know what it's like. You have to sit you have to sit there and you have to make these words march in order. Um, and then I try to reserve the middle of the day for just the crap, the nonsense, the you know, routine emails. And then later in the day, and it's true, I mean, when I'm on your end of the, the microphone, um, I, or, you know, interviewing for, for books and things like that, I like to do my interviews around this time of day, my, my interviews as an interviewer, because my interview, I mean, it's like my interviews are like yours, like you're, we're not investigative reporters, we're not trying to trap people, <laughs> we're not, you know what I mean, we're not yeah. taking a deposition, we're just saying, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, hey let's have a good conversation. James, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what about me, Dan? Hey, you know. Um, and, and that's better when you're, um, but, but most people, uh, unfortunately, I don't, don't think they know the science. They don't, they're not as deliberate, but I think once people know the science, I think they can make better decisions about when to do stuff in the course of, in the course of a day. I, um, have been endeavoring to put into practice some of your great teachings and I will of tell course. you unequivocally, no brainer. It just makes sense. It's awesome. Oh, good. Phew. Okay. No, I'm serious. Like. I thought I, I didn't know where that sentence was going. No, I, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to I'm, put your ideas into practice, and I've discovered no. Or and you're all wrong. wrong. No, no. Like, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. For me, the like the two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, Four one o'clock, two o'clock meeting, where like we're supposed to tackle something complicated and difficult, and like go around the table and sort something out. Like it just never works. It's just like it's the wrong time for me. Yeah. And you have a team too. So you have, I mean, on some of your, at least like some of your businesses, right? You have a team of people who, and so you can be, it's like, like as a boss, like I'm not really a boss. I'm just a, you know, one, per, you know, Daniel Pink Incorporated has a total of two employees and then a few contractors. And so it's not like we have like a giant staff meeting every it's quite morning. It's a prolific like organization. Yes, indeed. We, um, we have, um, well, I mean, I, I mean, this is another, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you'll, you'll appreciate this, but anytime anybody goes to work for themselves, I, they, and they ask me a question, they are subjected to my lecture on the importance of low overhead, ah. uh, which I really believe. Um, and anyway, but enough about that. So, um, um, but you know, like for you, you know, you have a team, um, you know, if you have a team of people who are larky, larks, larky, early morning people, and they're doing analytic, analytic stuff, you know, don't have the meeting about the, you know, the parking permit policy at 930 in the morning exactly. during their best time. Have that meeting at two o'clock. That's exactly you know, I right. I talked to an exec at, at, a, at a big company, like, like a seriously big, like a big exec at a big company. I don't want to say the person's name. Big exec at a big company. And this person was saying, oh, yeah, we had, our, we had like our big product review meeting at two in the afternoon. And I just, you know, this wasn't very good. I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. You know, um, so, um, but just, a, the, you know, what, the good thing about all this, I, I think there's two good things about this body of, of uh, research. One is that uh, the evidence is pretty clear and, and we can make decisions based on evidence. And then if we do make a few of these decisions based on evidence, I really think that it improves things for us. It improves our overall sense of well-being. It can improve our health. There's some good health effects of this. Uh, and it certainly can improve our productivity and our creativity, basically our performance writ large. Mm -hmm. Awesome. If I may switch gears. Yeah. Uh, I know I sound like a, a super fan here, but uh, a, 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 another thing that I find interesting is, so we both went to law school. We did. I yeah, went 
to an excellent law school called Harvard. I know yes. you had to go to Yale. Yes. Which must I just be saw. I just saw the numbers on Supreme Court justices. It's unbelievable. I just saw this chart. There's this, actually this interesting. There's this interesting uh, blog uh-huh. called um, uh, Empirical SCOTUS. Okay. You know. This? You know this? It's basically. No. Like, yeah. So it's basically a Supreme Court blog, but it's 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 all like data analytics. Uh-huh. Um, and some of it's not very sophisticated at all, but I just I literally like this, this afternoon, uh, there was a, there was some data on where the Supreme Court justices over time have gone to, uh, gone to law school. And it's right. like, it's Harvard, like, I think Harvard might have as many as the next four combined. And the next two, right. the next two are, are, are Yale and then Columbia and then I think Michigan. And then, then it's like, and then there's a bunch of one-offs. So all of which is to say, continue your question. <laughs> so you, you've what I heard there is you have conceded that Harvard is far superior to Yale as an academic institution just across the board. Uh, oh, uh, uh, from not only law school but the entire institution. The whole thing. Um, I don't know if I'll concede that, but, um, <laughs> but I'm willing to. I'm willing to, as you would, as you lawyers would say, I'm willing to stipulate it for the purposes of this conversation. Ah, uh, oh, <laughs> phenomenal! I love it. I love. I'm a recovering lawyer as well, my friend. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, I know. That's why. That's why I call no, you lawyer. Well, uh, and lawyer slash recovering. I, I guess I was I was closer to it. But all, all kidding aside, I, I've heard you, or I, I've I've read. You, you know, you, you you've written about sort of a moment in life when you decided to quote go out, go out on your own. I think you were uh, you were in politics, right? You wrote speeches for yes, Gore yeah, at one yeah, point. Yeah. And so, um, at a personal level, I wonder yeah. if you wouldn't mind sharing. Kind of what that was like. What you know, what, sure. what was going through your head? What were you looking to do, and, and how did sure. it turn out for you? Sure. Uh, so yeah, no, happy to talk about that. So um, and, and it goes to. I mean, I'll try to be brisk in the storytelling here because not to go into all the hideous room emptying details here, but it takes a little bit of context here. So and you, and you said the context in some ways by going by mentioning that I did go to law school. So I went to law school. Uh, I actually didn't know what lawyers did. I didn't really know what law school was. Uh, what I did know is that I was from the Midwest and risk averse, and um, I thought that was a good thing to do. So, um, so I went to law school. I decided within law school, there's no way in God's green earth I was ever going to practice law. So I graduated from law school. I was actually one of three people in my law school class who graduated unemployed. Um, and um, and so I started working. I was really into politics. I started working in politics, and in a, in a and just in a way that was like like so many things in life was not necessarily planned, but it was more sort of circumstantial. As sure. sort of as I became a speechwriter, largely because you know I I could do it, and so it needed to get done, and then so, and then it needed to get done again, and I could do it, and it needed to get done again, and I could do it, and suddenly that's what I was doing for my life. All right, uh, nothing more exciting than that. So the speech writer. Can I get a time out for one second? Yeah. When I clerked for O'Connor, one of the things I got to do was write a bunch of speeches for her. Uh-huh. And one of the things that I love about writing speeches for larger than life personalities like that is everything is hilarious. Any attempt at humor just kills. <laughs> you get, just because you get, of the, sort of the stature, the environment, yeah, the, yeah. The, people yeah. show up wanting a lover. Yeah, and so I, I loved writing these little, you know, that I thought were kind of clever. But you know, she would come back. Oh, everybody was so laughing, and I'm like, Justice, that had nothing to do with what I wrote. That's because you were saying it. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Exactly. Back to I mean, your story. So right if Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, gets up in front of the audience and says, "Okay, um, so this reminds me of the time that a that a priest, a rabbi, and a yeah. mom, a mom <laughs> walking to the bar. Everyone's cracking up already. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, so, uh, so I was doing that, and it was all right. Uh, and then, um. Then, then suddenly I realized that I didn't really want to work in politics the rest of my life. I sort of looked out into the future and said, okay, what happens next? What happens next? Where, where do I go from here? What happens to people like me if they stay in this field? And I did not like that at all. President at the same time, ha! No, you don't, you don't really go from being a, uh, a communication staffer speechwriter to the presidency. <laughs> that's usually, that's an, there's an indirect route to that destination at the very best. So, um, but there was something else going on, and, and again, I, I will round the story sure. out here in a moment, is that from the time that I was in college, really, um, I was always, quote-unquote, writing on the side. 
Uh, I would write uh, magazine articles, uh, newspaper articles, uh, columns, things like that. Um, in in college, I, I was a, I was a actually a linguistics major, which is pretty kind of hardcore mathematical kind of social science. Uh, more, I mean, as you know, as a math person, more mathematical than than many other kinds of social science. So, like it was kind of thing where like you know a lot of our required courses were also required courses in computer science, and so it was pretty hardcore. Um, I loved it, and um, uh, but at the time, I, you know, I I I, I won a sort of story prize. Because uh, I was just doing that for fun the whole time, you know, law school writing on the side, these jobs I'm writing on the side, and finally, and this is a long time ago. It's like I'm, you know, 30 years old, maybe even more than that, 30, even long older than that, to like early 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm working late at night on this article um, that I'm not even getting paid for, and you know, my wife is beginning to say, "Wait a second, this thing that you're doing, quote unquote, on the side, I think you kind of like it." Because you've been doing it ever since I've known you. You've been doing it for like the last 10 or 15 years. And you've always, but you've always been doing it as like a side hustle, as a side project. Mm-hmm. Uh, yet here you are like working at midnight in this very demanding job, working on something else. I think you kind of like this. I think that's who you are. And, um, Good for and, her. So, in, and so in my early 30s, and, and, I, and I think it goes to the question of, you know, it was like people say, okay, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the people who's piled on to, the, to how much I hate the advice find your passion. I, I hate that advice. And and um and and um and My I passion think part, is hanging out and watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah. So and and so finding out so so finding your passion I think is less important than sort of discover like what do you do? Like like no one's watching, what do you do? And so it turns out that that's what I did. I was a writer. And um and uh, so anyway, um so um it's now twenty one years ago actually. 21 years ago, I, we, we decided to, I decided to leave my job and see, and take, and we're going to say, let's take two or three years, see how it goes, to sort of make writing on my own stuff the central thing that we, that I, that I do. Now, here's the thing. My wife was working, my wife was a, was a lawyer at the Justice Department. She didn't leave her job. She didn't leave her, uh, she, didn't, she didn't get rid of her health insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, I still had student loans. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and uh, we had a kid. And so it was this very kind of like, you know, calculated risk where I would try this for a couple of years, see how it would work. And Jessica would keep her job and her health insurance and her salary and all that sort of stuff. And we would try to make it work. And if it didn't, we were fortunate that it didn't. I had enough, you know, I could go become a speechwriter again. I could go work in PR or something like that. And so, and so, that's, how, and, and so that's how I did it. And so for the last 21 years, uh, that's what I've been doing. Basically just kind of making it up as I go along every single day. So it's, it's turning out all right. Uh, it's good. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. And I like it. You know, here's the thing. It's like, I think that is who I am. Um, and I think that's an important part of, you know, I think that's an important, and, and I don't think it's, I think it's an important part of the scope. I think it's an important part of, of, of navigating one's life is figuring out who you are. And, um, you know, I had a certain amount, obviously I had a certain amount of privilege because I got a great education. Um, and I, I mean, I had a huge amount of privilege. I was born in the United States. I had a huge amount of privilege because um, my parents were both college, uh, had, had college degrees. I, I, I had a huge amount of privilege because I got to go to some great education institutions. Uh, but I think that for anybody, whatever their station in life, I think, you know, like, who are you? What, what, you know, what is, what is it that you do that is, is important? Because if you, if, you, if you run against the grain of that, I think you, you're, you're unhappy. And I, but I think the dirty little secret about that is that if you run against the grain of who you are, I actually think that your, your, your material outcomes, your production outcomes are less favorable, too. No question. So, um, it's anyway, a sort so. of Zen mind game. Yeah, there is a Zenness to it. Yeah, there is. If, a, you, if, you, if you want the reward too much, you mess up the journey in getting there, and you know, you're better off to just focus on what you know what you're doing now. Right, right, right. And with with the degree of pra- it's like sort of it's a pragmatic Zen thing because like I like I'm like you know I'm a very pragmatic I'm a very pragmatic person. So when I went out on my own, as I said, it was a very is a very much of a calculated risk and. And even today, 21 years later, I mean, I'm talking to you from my office. My office is the garage of our house. In 21 years, I've never had an office outside of my house. That is awesome. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to pay rent to somebody else because that's a cost that 
You know, it's just that's a pure cost. It doesn't it doesn't enhance my productivity at all. I will pay things. I will I if I'm going to pay for overhead. I'll pay to have a great computer and a fast internet connection because that materially improves my work product. Um, um, I will pay for talent, so I'll, I'll find if I'm going to have contractors working on stuff, I'll find the very best person I can for that. But when it comes to things like, you know, oh, I'm going to have a nice brochure, I'm going to have a swank office on K Street, no freaking way, man. Um, you always have to be, you know, thinking about like your, you have to be thinking about your costs um, and thinking, and you know, but again, I think I think a lot of really good entrepreneurs are like that. I think a lot of I think that in some ways, the, the popular view of entrepreneurs. Um, portrays them falsely that they portray them as these kind of wild and woolly uh risk takers when yeah. in fact they're they're uh, to you you use your word again they're they're, they're pragmatic risk yeah. takers. they're willing to take a risk but they're also smart about uh, hedging against some of the downdraft yeah i don't think you would have enjoyed practicing law dan oh no i would have hated it <laughs> yeah no, I think that's clear I think pretty clear. The other thing I think is that I would have sucked at it. Yeah. Well. Yeah, no, I would have. Yeah. Interesting. Well, for all of us, I'm certainly very glad that you decided you not to. Uh, and, and, and I can't say enough how much I uh, immensely enjoy your work. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Sure. Maybe we can do this again sometime. I feel like I've kept you too long, but I oh, could speak to all. you forever. I, you, you were talking about my favorite subject, which is me. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's a good place to leave it, Dan. All right. Dan Pink, expert on Dan Pink. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to go back to do two or three parts of this important topic. Phenomenal. <laughs> 